I'm Ann Calabrese. I'm the president of the Federalist Society, and today we're absolutely delighted to um, be hearing from um, Professor Josh Blackman. He's a professor at, I'm so sorry, at Southern Texas College of Law, South correct? Texas College oh, of South Texas College of Law. And um, among other things, he teaches constitutional law there. He is the founder and president of the Harlan Institute, and he's also the founder of a website called FantasyScotus.net, um, which is the internet's um, premier Supreme Court fantasy league. Um, and he also has a blog spot at JoshBlackman.com. Um, he's recently authored a book called Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare and um, over a dozen other articles about constitutional law. On top of that, he's actually served as a clerk for um, two different judges. He clerked for uh, Danny J. Boggs on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, so I'm sure you've all read of some of those, um, some of Judge Boggs' um, opinions in, in some of your case books. The name certainly stood out as familiar to me. And then also he clerked for the Honorable Kim R. Gibson on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Um, he's a graduate of George Mason University uh, Law School, so not too far from here. And um, without further ado, Professor Josh Blackman. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Good Monday so far? <laughs> All right. You guys want a small room? Just move over here if you want to uh, grab some seats. Okay. All right. So. I have to confess error, okay? I, I don't like the game like this. When I wrote this book about Obamacare, I thought, you know, it's done. I sent this book to press in July of 2013. I thought, okay, the battle over Obamacare is eventually done. The presidential election settled it. It will come into effect in January of 2014, and everything will be okay, right? <laughs> Did that happen? No. I actually have to confess error. I think I need to write a sequel. Because the first book I wrote was actually called The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare. I think part two has to be the political challenge to Obamacare, because there's so much ahead of us. So this is an important law for a lot of reasons. By the way, everyone knows what Obamacare is? Am I, everyone? Okay, good. It's also known as the Affordable Care Act. But this law was a signature achievement of President Obama. But this law really tested the mettle of all three branches of our government, and the Constitution itself. This law, I think more than any other in our lifetimes, has tested how we think about the Constitution, how we think about constitutional law. So let's just start at the basic. What does the Affordable Care Act do? It tries to make health care more affordable. I mean, that, that's inherent in its name. So there are many attempts to try to make health care more affordable. Who knows what this picture is? Let's see. Hillary, Hillary Care. Hillary Care. Remember, remember this picture? I don't know alive when this happened. I, I was young, too. So in the early 1990s, there was a movement to try to reform health care. The idea was health care is too expensive, and the government should have a role. But the main plank of Hillary Clinton's plan was effectively single-payer health care. There would be one health care provider for everyone. The biggest problem of Hillary's plan was that if you happen to like your doctor, you'd not be able to keep it. And this torpedoed the law. Keep that in mind for the future. So who knows what this is? Oh, this one's tougher. Okay. These were a series of commercials aired during the 1990s called the Harry and Louise commercials. This was your average ma and pa from the Midwest sitting around talking about, well, you know, I don't like this Hillary Care, because under Hillary Care, I won't be able to keep my doctor. I won't be able to keep my plan. And this single commercial torpedoed the entire health care law. So it was recognized very early on that in order to change health care in America, one of the essential components would be that if you like your insurance, you'll be able to keep it. People didn't want to lose it. What people don't recognize is that in, 19, in 2009, a poll was done. 90% of Americans were happy with their health insurance. 10% were very unhappy. But 90% were generally happy with their benefits. Okay? This is the backdrop that leads us until the Affordable Care Act. So when des designing a law to health healthcare, one of the core tenets was, you like, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. This will only make you better. Okay? But there were significant costs about this law, which are only now becoming evident. So we fast forward to 2009, the inauguration of President Obama. By the way, does anyone know that Obama shared the record with FDR? Okay? What's the record? The only president to take the oath of office four times. And why four times? I remember this. Remember the first time they took the oath with the Chief Justice? They messed up the oath. Remember that? Okay. So they did a do-over the next uh, the next day at the White House to make sure it was actually legitimately president. Fast forward to 2013, when he was inaugurated the second time. Okay. The Constitution says, who knows? What day is the president sworn in under the Constitution? Who knows? There is a one. January 20th. Yeah, it's in there. Check it out. It's in there. Yeah. January 20th, right? This year, January 20th, was on a Sunday. They couldn't swim on a Sunday, so they had the real one and the fake one in front of everyone. Okay, so the president of the oath four times, okay? 
shortly after the president came into office, he decided that he would advance his law. This would be a signature crowning achievement of patient protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010. Okay? No one remembers the Affordable Care Act. I'm sorry, no one remembers patient protection. That's just dropped off. Now it's all about the Affordable Care Act. Okay? And what did this law do? This law did a lot of things, but its core protection was to make health care more affordable. Okay? How does the Affordable Care Act work? Okay. Simply, it brings more people to the insurance pool. The way insurance works is, generally, if you have a higher need for care, perhaps you're sick or have a pre-existing condition, your coverage will be more expensive. Okay? What the Affordable Care Act does, it says, listen, we have all these sick people with insurance, and we have all these young and healthy people with that insurance people, like many of you. What Obamacare does is bring all these people to the same risk pool to lower the cost. So for the people who are really sick, it will bring their cost down. For people who are young and healthy, like you, it will bring their cost up. This is how Obamacare works. How does it force you to go into this risk pool? Through something called an individual mandate. Okay? What does a mandate do? It says if you do not have insurance, and insurance is very specific, it has to be a very specified plan, you have to pay a penalty. The goal of this law was to force young and healthy people to subsidize old and sick people. There's no other way of looking at it. Okay? It would also penalize people who had certain health care plans that were very generous. This law was meant to equalize care. People couldn't have very good care, people couldn't have very bad care. It was very much for an equalizing law. But the main problem with the Affordable Care Act, however, was the Constitution. More precisely, under what constitutional authority can Congress make you buy health insurance? Okay? And an interesting thing happened with the ACA. A social movement kind of sprung up. You guys remember the Tea Party? Remember that? Yeah, they, they're still around. It's kind of quiet, though. The Tea Party grew in large part in opposition to Obamacare. That was their single rallying cry. And they didn't just oppose Obamacare on policy grounds. They certainly did. They thought it was a terrible policy that it would destroy the economy. But they also oppose it on constitutional grounds. Okay? They argued that Congress can't force us to buy insurance. Congress can't make us do this. And you had these massive rallies throughout the country. And they marched on Washington in the tens of thousands. And, and this law became very, very unpopular as it was going through the system. We don't remember this, but there was widespread opposition to this law. This wasn't something that was very, that was very popular. But at the time in Congress, the Democrats had a supermajority. You might remember after the 2008 election, the president had 60 seats in the Senate, right, and over, I think, a 70-seat lead in the House. Okay? As you all know, when you have a 60-seat lead, do you have to work with the filibuster? No, the filibuster doesn't matter. The Democrats, if they held tight, could break any filibuster. Okay? And that's exactly what Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid wanted to do. They realized pretty early on there would be no Republican support for this law. Not a single Republican. It was actually tough keeping the Democrats in line. They kind of bribed them off with these people to Louisiana purchase and appointments for kickback. But he was able to keep all of his senators in line. By the way, does anyone know how many pages the Affordable Care Act is? You want to take a throw a number. 5,000. Close. 2,700. Close. You get the winner. You get a free sandwich. Or <laughs> <laughs> chips, I don't know. For winner. 2,700 pages, right? <coughs> the law was 2,700 pages long. The final version of the law was only released roughly three weeks before it was voted on, okay? <laughs> I like to say it's basically three copies of Atlas Shrugs stacked on top of each other, <laughs> and even more painful to read, okay? <laughs> no one could have conceivably read it. Uh, famously, Nancy Pelosi said you have to pass the law to find out what's in it. And actually, there's this past week she was on Meet the Press and asked her about it. She's like, yeah, well, you know, we're still finding out the good parts of this law and, and, and some of the bad parts as well, I guess. But this law was passed on Christmas Eve 2009, December 24th, on a straight party line vote. Not a single Republican voted for this law. The final vote was 60 to 39, okay? And usually when a bill of this size is being debated, it follows a certain path. It usually starts in one house, goes to the other, goes back and forth three times as they kind of iron out all the kinks and make it work. Remember how, how Bill becomes a law of false rocks? <laughs> That's not what happened here for one very important reason. Because this guy died. Senator Ted Kennedy, remember him? Yeah. Senator Ted Kennedy dedicated much of his life to reforming health care. This was his, his, his cause. This was what he wanted to do. Okay. After Sen Senator Ted Kennedy died, there was a special election held in January not too long after the Christmas Eve vote. 
And who replaced Ted Kennedy? Scott. Scott Brown. Let me put this in perspective for you. Scott Brown ran on the platform of stopping Obamacare. Listen to it again. He ran on the platform of stopping Obamacare. Massachusetts elected a Republican to replace <coughs> Ted Kennedy on the promise of killing Obamacare. Do you have any idea how staggering that is? That in Massachusetts, one of those liberal states in the country, a Republican was elected to replace Ted Kennedy to stop Obamacare. This law was very unpopular. Very unpopular. And this is a testament to its unpopularity. So now, what happens once Scott Brown has the office? The Democrats lost the filibuster. They only had 59 votes now, and they cannot stop a Republican filibuster. Okay. So generally, what do you think would usually happen? Say, oh, shucks, let's, let's you know, try and get some bipartisan support. No. That wasn't going to happen from either side. So what did they do? They sent it to the House. And they said, we will not debate this law a single minute in the Senate. Why? Because once it goes back to the Senate, it's dead. It's filibustered. No debate. So in the House, Nancy Pelosi had a problem. What's the problem? The version of the law passed in the Senate was not the final version. It was a draft. It was not meant to be final. There were a lot of bugs and kinks and things we're really finding out now. So how is it possible for <laughs> the Senate to vote on version A, <coughs> the House to vote on version B, and the President to sign version B? We all know that the President must have signed the law passed by both houses. Okay? This is where it gets funky. This is where John Boehner is not too happy. By the way, I, I love this picture. It gives you a scope of the size of the law. Okay? So Pelosi had a problem. She had to pass a version of the law, but she couldn't send it back to the Senate. So what they do? This. Something called the budget reconciliation process. Okay? You probably never even heard of this process, but it's meant to help iron out very small defects between two versions of the law. Okay? It's not meant to do anything big. It's meant to do very small things. But what Pelosi actually did was take the entire 2,700-page bill, cross out huge chunks of it, and add new language. This was a, a striking use of the democratic process, where you had a law that was entirely opposed by the Senate, by all right, it would have been stopped by the Senate filibuster, Pelosi skipped it. And they basically rewrote the law in the House without the need for the Senate to vote on it again. Okay? And this was the bill that was sent to the President's desk. This was the bill that passed with not a single, to that goose egg right there, not a single Republican vote, and 34 Democrats across the aisle. Number 34 is momentous, because just last week there was a bill to delay uh, 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 Obamacare. Um, you can keep your plans if you like it. That also had 34 Democrats supporting it. So this law has never had consensus support. So keep in mind when we're talking about this law, that 49% of Congress opposed it. And this law has never crossed the 50% threshold, ever, at any point in its life. It's always been unpopular. Okay? So the law went to the White House, right? President Obama signs it. You can see here he has uh, 23 commemorative pens. He uses each pen to sign his part of his signature uh, to hand out his mementos. Okay? And as the president was signing, he's smiling, he's happy. What's that? Yeah. March, so this was March 23rd, 2010. He said something to the effect of, the fight over Obamacare is over, right? <laughs> this battle is over. Let's move on. God. Yeah, was, we were so young, right? <laughs> this was March 23rd, 2010, almost, almost four years ago now at this point. The battle over Obamacare was just getting started, okay? So the first <laughs> salvo in this law was the Constitution. And was this law constitutional? So uh, how many of you taken con law? Okay, most of you. Okay, good. So, anyone taking con law? I'm trying to figure out what case we're talking about here. This is a good extra credit. Get another, get another soda. Oh, it's weak. Um, oh, my gosh. Come on. Yeah, we're going to be filbert. Exactly. Ding, ding, ding. You don't get a prize. You work here. <laughs> so this is where I go. That's all right. Wicked, I figured the Fed's not present knows this game. <laughs> so this is the case of Wicked versus Filburn, okay? And never remember what the case is about. You had this guy who's a farmer named Roswell Filburn. You had this evil-looking secretary of agriculture, Claude Wickard. He these charts in the back, very FDR-ish. So he had, the Department of Agriculture had this plan saying you can only grow so much wheat on your farm, right? There was a limit how much wheat you grow. They said that makes markets better by limiting production, whatever, okay? Farmer Filburn said, wait a minute. I'm growing this wheat not for a sale, but just for my own animals and for my own personal consumption. This wheat never leaves my farm. 
Okay? How can Congress possibly have the power to regulate it? Because it's only on my farm. It's not interstate commerce. And what did the Supreme Court hold? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. It's about the, the law of constitution. Why? Um, oh my gosh, because if, if aggregate effect, if every farmer were to refrain from buying wheat in the market, then it would have a significant impact on interstate commerce. A pause, good. Okay. Hmm? <laughs> We're yes. Years ago now. Yes. <laughs> the decision to grow your own wheat affects the interstate market. How? Well, if you didn't grow his own wheat, you would have to buy it elsewhere, right? And if you bought it elsewhere, that would affect the market. So your decision not to, your decision to grow your own wheat affects the interstate market. This is what's been called the substantial effects test, that anything within one state that has a substantial effect elsewhere is interstate commerce, okay? So this was a case from the 1930s. This was the commerce <coughs> case, okay? One other case to think about, now this one's tougher. Who knows, what, who knows what this case is? I'll give you another picture, it's a little hint. No, not, I always get this, not Terry Shiva. <laughs> yeah, what's I it called? I can't remember the name. Right. But Rage, good, 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 what's the case about? Marijuana. Yeah, what's, what's the case about? If you have a comprehensive plan, then it's you can regulate the market even if the individual bits don't fit interstate commerce. Very good. Okay. So this case involved Angel Race. She had a very uh, sophisticated form of cancer. And the only treatment that would give her any pain relief was medicinal marijuana. And who's what this thing is? What? <laughs> a volcano? <laughs> yeah, a vaporizer. A volcano? <laughs> Women, man. <laughs> Come on, George Mason, you gotta, you gotta try. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a vaporizer, right? Vape, as, as they call it. This was used to ingest medicinal marijuana, okay? She argued, okay, listen, I'm using marijuana growing within state lines, within California, where under state law it's legal. How can Congress ban this locally grown marijuana? And the Supreme Court said, as you noted, if you have a broad, comprehensive regime to fight drugs, it's necessary to police even intrastate marijuana. Even more importantly, her decision, her decision to not, I'm sorry, her decision to grow her own marijuana affects the interstate marijuana market. Okay? What you might ask is the interstate marijuana market, I don't know. But apparently her decision not to buy wheat <coughs> in the market affects interstate commerce. And this was actually, I would say, the wheat and weed case, or actually grain and ganja. Uh, uh, works also. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, these are the two cases that kind of define the contours of the Commerce Clause uh, and that we have. This case is actually argued by Randy Barnett, who wrote the forward to my book. This is Angel Raish uh, crying when she lost her case. Um, this is not a good day for her. But that takes us to broccoli, right? Do you remember broccoli? Yes, we remember broccoli. Does anyone actually like broccoli? I love broccoli. Really? Oh my god, I hate it. I don't like broccoli. <laughs> Is that from the Simpsons or Family Guard? Oh, that's like the first one. Broccoli's number one cause of death for all vegetables. How? Choke, choke, choke. Oh, yeah. I can do that. Well, it's full of folic acid. It's great. So, broccoli, right? What the hell does broccoli have to do with health care? Well, the reason why the government made you buy health insurance under Obamacare was because it made you healthier. By having insurance, you can improve health care, whatever, right? Broccoli, contrary to what she said, is showing us to be very healthy. <laughs> it's not a killer, right? I guess I didn't know that. Can, can Congress make you buy broccoli under the rationale that broccoli will make you healthier? This was the question that defined the entire Obamacare debate. Can they make you buy broccoli? Okay? Can Stewie or... or uh, <laughs> Or the president make me broccoli, or can they make you buy a GM vehicle? <laughs> right? This actually came up with the Supreme Court. If Congress can pass a law making you buy health care because it helps people's health, what can't they do? This is what we call a limiting principle, right? The idea goes, if Congress can make you do this, why can't they make you do that? You might have heard like a slippery slope. What is your limiting principle? How do we stop from going from health care to broccoli? And this was often one of the toughest questions for the government to answer throughout the entire litigation. Anyway, back to politics, right? So if you actually see here, a signature is very jagged because all the different pens he used. Uh, yeah, yeah. It looks like a terrible signature, but March 23rd, 2010, approved, right? This is, this is law. This is a law of the land. Okay. Who wants to guess how long it took for lawsuits to be filed against it? Seven minutes. <laughs> seven. Seven. Seven minutes. That's a whole total. Uh, there were two main lawsuits that were brought. 
the main one was by uh, 26 attorneys general who brought a suit in Florida. And the second one, oh, poor Ken, I got to change this. Uh, he's a, everyone knows who this guy is? Yeah. He was in love with my law school. Uh, he didn't do too well this past election. <laughs> Not me. The second main loss was brought by uh, uh, your, your I guess, current and soon to be former Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, um, who challenged the law and its constitutionality. And uh, remarkably, Cuccinelli argued in court that this law is unconstitutional, and this violates some Virginia law that says you can't be forced to buy insurance, whatever. The court bought his argument. A district court in Richmond, not, not too far from me, Judge Hudson, struck down this law as it was unconstitutional. This was a stunning turn of events. It was the first time a court had actually found that Obamacare was unconstitutional. The president was not, <laughs> was, was not happy with this. Okay? That's not good. My remote drop. You should drop the mic, not remote. So, the law was still quite unpopular. But the main lawsuit was actually being filed in Florida. And this is Judge uh, Roger Vincent. And what was remarkable about Judge Vincent's opinion was he found that not only was the mandate unconstitutional, but the entire Obamacare law, all 2,700 pages was unconstitutional. He struck it all down. And this is my really sad Obama picture <laughs> because he was not happy with this. Because up to this time, I'm sure if you ask your, your, your professors, this challenge was not deemed legitimate. People thought this is a stupid case. This is not going to win. There's no chance the courts will strike it down. And we had two district courts actually kill this law, which was simply sunny. So we had then appeals in the courts of appeals. And it was primarily being argued by this guy, who was uh, <coughs> then acting Solicitor General Neil Katyal, and uh, former super guy uh, uh, Paul Clement, who argues every single case ever. <laughs> so they argued in various courts of appeals. One of the first cases we argued was actually in the Sixth Circuit in uh, Cincinnati, where I, where I clerked. And, and strikingly, the court upheld it. Uh, Judge Jeff Sutton, who was a, a Bush appointee, actually upheld the law. So this was momentous because he had a conservative judge find the law as constitutional. Uh, this is my happy about <laughs> he's, he's smiling here. Uh, the, the 11th Circuit, though, was the main event. This is where the suit was brought from uh, uh, Florida, uh, appealed to the 11th Circuit. And what's stunning about this case was you had a joint opinion by Judges Hall and Dubina that found the mandate was unconstitutional. Okay? And this means we have a circuit split. What happens when we have a circuit split? Supreme Court, right? The court will not take stuff. So you had the 4th Circuit, go, uh, 6th Circuit going one way, 11th going the other way, we have a circuit split. Okay? And uh, th this, this, is, uh, this is my stop Obama picture. We have to, we have to stop this, okay? Your own circuit, Fourth Circuit, not too far from here, uh, actually upheld the law under this uh, weird thing called the Tax Anti-Injunction Act. Has anyone ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay. So generally, you've all paid taxes, right? I hope so. If you're assessed a tax by the IRS that you don't agree with, can you just not pay it and challenge it in court? No. If the IRS gives you a tax that you don't like, what you have to do is you have to pay it and then challenge it in court and seek a refund. That's how it works. The reason why that's the process is because think called the Tax <coughs> Anti-Injunction Act. Congress doesn't want all these people failing to pay taxes, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about this law. When Obamacare was passed, it was passed as a regulation of interstate commerce. That's why I mentioned the Wicker case and the, ma the marijuana case. It said, we can regulate interstate commerce and, you know, healthcare is commerce, therefore we can regulate it. But an alternate ground on which this law could be defended is as a tax. Why? Even though the law called the mandate a penalty, use the word penalty, it's collected in a similar manner as a tax would. It's collected by the IRS, it's added to your tax return, blah, 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 blah. So it's similar in function to a tax. You're actually collecting money. Okay? But there's a problem. If this law was a tax, it would not be collected until January 2014, as we know now. You could not sue on this tax until January 2014. You would actually lack standing. So what the Fourth Circuit held was, because of this Tax Anti-Injunction Act, and this law is a tax, you can't sue yet. It's not yet ripe, as we would say. But that creates a problem. If it's not a tax, it must be okay under the Commerce Clause. But as we'll see later, the Supreme Court does something kind of funky. But keep that in mind for now. The Fourth Circuit said, this is a tax and you can't sue on it yet until 2014, okay? That, that was what the, first, what the Fourth Circuit said. Okay, this is my really happy Obama picture. He, he, he's smiling there. The final court to hear it was actually the D.C. Circuit. We had a new Solicitor General, Don Verrilli. We'll come back to it in a moment. <coughs> the D.C. Circuit upheld the law, but they did so in a very interesting way. One of the judges, Judge Brett Kavanaugh, said this. He's like, listen, 
We have this long bill, it's 2,700 pages, but all we care about is this one provision, the mandate, right? If Congress had written the mandate a little bit differently, had they called it a tax, they changed like three words, they changed penalty to tax, it will be clearly constitutional. Why? It will be just like Social Security. You've all paid Social Security tax? Yes? Social Security is a payroll tax. There's a tax on your income, and then you pay into this trust fund that exists somewhere. And then when you become 65 or you become dis disabled, you get money back from it. Maybe. Maybe. Oh. <laughs> not, not you. Not you. <laughs> In theory, right? In theory. Trust fund. Uh, lockbox. But, <laughs> I've had the lockbox in a while. But the issue is, it's a payroll tax. The courts have held Social Security a payroll tax. But Kavanaugh says, listen, what if we tweak this law a little bit? What if instead of calling it a penalty, we called it a tax? Then it'll be constitutional. That's a wonderful argument, except for the fact that's not what Congress did. <coughs> Kavanaugh can see that. He's saying, well, you know what? We're judges, right? And we have a duty to uphold laws. So what if we just read it a little differently, right? We just pretended, make believe, Mr. Rogers, like unicorns, right? <laughs> <coughs> that was a very influential statement for the Solicitor General. Because he was like, listen, we have this conservative judge who's saying if you read the law a little differently as a tax, it's OK. Keep that in mind, too. Anyway, so happy Obama here. Courts of appeals with three courts that have held it, one court that struck it down. That's still enough to create a circuit split. Okay? So off to the Supreme Court we go. Oh, they look so happy, you know, and cheerful, and char oh, look, look at those smiling faces, right? <laughs> uh, it's not going to say that way for long. Uh, this case, perhaps more than any other of our generation, gives a very close nexus between law and politics. These are very important interwoven concepts. Because the Supreme Court does not operate in a vacuum. Right? When they issue a ruling, they are touching on some very important things. Just look at the past years, gay marriage, voting rights, affirmative action, gun, uh, abortion. These are very important topics. And the court has to always be cognizant of where they are when they say certain things. Right? So, who knows who this picture is? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> yes, yes. This was... <laughs> oh, I'm trying to lead up. This was from the State of the Union in 2010. This was shortly after the Citizens United case was decided. You might remember that President Obama got up at the State of the Union and criticized the Supreme Court, they were sitting like five feet away from him, <laughs> for you know, opening the floodgates to foreign spending elections and reversing 100 years of press and all this hyperbole, right? None of it was true. But did it matter? Unfortunately, Justice Alito, who was sitting there, actually, he wasn't actually wagging his finger, but he actually mouthed and not true, not true. He should have known there were cameras in that room. That, that, would, that would have been a very good assumption for him. But he, I guess he forgot that for a moment. I think it's in the court. Um, he doesn't care because it's Justice Alito. Yes, and, and in fact, he's gotten in trouble for rolling his eyes at Justice Ginsburg. People have actually commented. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, uh, my, my friend Garrett Epps had a piece in, I think, The Atlantic uh, uh, earlier this year where his Alito rolls his eyes at Justice Ginsburg all the time. Uh, he's an interesting guy. But um, I have to have an animated GIF as well. But we have to remember that the president is not afraid to go after the court, to criticize the court. He did so at the State of the Union, and he did so several times later in this case. So this is a backdrop we need to understand. It. This is not a shrinking, violent president, right? He, he's not afraid to flaunt his power, um, a, a, as we see now. Uh, and when we read Mark Stein's piece in the National Review last night, it was quite good. So this brings to the Supreme Court. Now, how many of you have been to the Supreme Court for arguments? Only three, four of you? You're in Virginia. This is not good. Go. <laughs> Go to a case and get tickets. Don't do what I did like an idiot, which is camp outside, right? So has anyone ever camped outside for tickets? Kill me. Anyway, <laughs> it's not good. The only way to get tickets to the Supreme Court is to actually have a friend inside or to camp outside. They don't sell tickets. And usually, you have to wait overnight. For example, I, I was at the case in McDonald's in Chicago. This was a big gun case. I got there, I think, 8 p.m. the night before. I slept outside for about 12 hours. It's cold in March in Washington. It's very cold and rainy. It's not a fun time. Okay. For this case, do anyone want to guess how long they have to wait for tickets? Anyone want to guess? Write right numbers. Ninety-six hours. The first person in line waited ninety-six hours for a ticket. In in the cold, you can see this picture better, but it was pouring rain. It was it had the tarps covering them. Uh, it would have been, I guess, ironic she got sick from waiting for the healthcare case, but <laughs> <laughs> she actually had two children with, with, uh, with a disability, so this was very significant to her, the first person in line. 
But uh, the main event arrived, and there were going to be three days of arguments. Okay? Yeah, actually, you have to list online. So there were going to be three days of arguments, okay? So let me break down the three days for you. The first day was a Monday. This was to consider the tax issue I mentioned before. Was this law a tax? Could this law be sued now? Or would you have to wait until 2014 when the law is being collected? Okay? The second day was the big day. This is, can Congress compel people under its commerce power to buy insurance? Okay? The third day was actually a double header. Um, in the morning, it was the issue of severability, which I haven't mentioned yet. But if we find that the mandate is unconstitutional, what happens to the rest of the law? Can it be severed or cut apart? The final argument, which something I haven't mentioned either, was about the Medicaid expansion. So one of the main ways the Affordable Care Act expands access to uh, health care is by giving more people free health care from the government. Everyone knows what Medicaid is. Medicare is for old people. Medicaid is for poor people. Medicaid used to say, if you're at the poverty line, at 100% of the poverty line, you get free health care. Okay? What this law said was, if you're now at 133% of the poverty line, now you get it. The states objected to this, and this would bankrupt them. They would not be able to afford to give health care to all these people. Now, the ACA effectively says the feds will pay almost 100% of the cost of that for the first few years, and there have to be like 90%. Okay? But the states are still worried they would not be able to afford to comply with this law. So those are the main arguments. So the first day of arguments was actually Paul Clement versus Don Verrilli. And, and one of the more interesting aspects of the argument the first day was something that the SG said. Okay? What the Solicitor General said to the court many times over was, we should construe this law as a tax. Even if it's not actually a tax, we should so construe it. Why? Because in practice, this law operates as a tax. There's no actual penalty. There's no actual mandate. He was doing what Judge Kavanaugh suggested. He was saying, we should just treat this as a tax. And this argument actually resonated with the court. Chief Justice Roberts actually seemed to accept it. He said, well, what if we just treat this as a tax with no penalty, with no actual uh, uh, mandate? Okay? So let me boil this down very simply. In the end, what the court did was they said that the individual mandate doesn't exist. The argument the government advanced and the one the court accepted was that there is no mandate to buy insurance. All there is is a tax on not having insurance. I know that sounds really weird. There's nothing requiring you to buy insurance. There's only a tax if you fail to have insurance. Okay, that was the argument being made. Day two was kind of a tricky one for the Solicitor General, and his biggest opponent was actually a glass of water. Uh, uh, it's actually, <laughs> It's actually kind of funny. So the Solicitor General usually does moots, two moots for every argument of the Supreme Court. Each moot lasts several hours. Okay? He had three arguments in one week. So he did six moots in the span of one week. And he had a sore throat because of all the talking. So shortly before he goes to the podium, he takes a glass of water. Okay? And it went down the wrong pipe. And he choked. He literally choked. If you listen to the recording, there are seven seconds of silence where he can't speak. He actually couldn't breathe, the water right down the wrong pipe. He was gagging. Um, and it was remarkable because he had to recover. But he, he eventually recovered. And he did a decent job. But his biggest problem was actually trying to articulate a limiting principle. And this was the point before. Um, you know, the court asked, what about broccoli? You know, what about General Motors vehicle? How can you limit this? And the government did not do a very good job narrowing or limiting what their principle was. They simply were uh, uh, kind of hoping for the court to give a principle for them, that didn't work. Uh, Paul Clement got up and said, listen, this is not right. If you give Congress the power to compel people to buy insurance, you're effectively forcing them into commerce. Okay? If you can force people into commerce, everything's commerce. Right? If you can make people engage in a commercial transaction, <coughs> then you can regulate anything people do. Because once they're engaging in a commercial transaction, you can regulate it. So what this law does is it forces you into commerce. Clement said this cannot be constitutional. Yeah. Next day, they actually talked about the severability issue. So the reason why Obamacare, again, works is because, and I can't stress this enough, it forces all of you young, healthy people to buy insurance. There's no way around it. So whenever the government says we want you young and healthy people to sign up, it's not because they really care about you. It's they realize <laughs> if you don't sign up, it's going to raise rates for everyone else. There's something called an adverse selection death spiral. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay. You heard of it? Cool. What is it? Uh, Professor Meese talked about it last year. It's basically the problem of adverse selection is the people who are being um, 
who have the most incentive to have the insurance of the people who are most suffering already, yes. and so they're the ones benefiting from it. It's eventually going to raise premiums. Yes. So here's what happens. So all the people who actually sign up for Obamacare, I'm going to bet you they're all people who really need it. And the people who have it, people who don't really need it. So what happens if all these old and sick people who have very high health care costs come into this pool, and all these young people stay outside of it? It makes the rates go through the roof. It's actually the death spiral, because you, you cannot stop it. This has happened in a number of states. So what stops this death spiral is the mandate, because it forces you young and healthy people to join. Okay? But what happens if the mandate's gone? This entire other regime crumbles. So what the government argued was that Affordable Care Act cannot exist without a mandate. It can't. We need the mandate for it to work. Okay? Uh, oh, here's <laughs> Scalia asking the broccoli question. He always, he always has to ask it. And they actually ask questions about General Motors vehicles. Okay? The final issue actually involved Medicaid, right? And I haven't mentioned much about this, but if you say the spending clause in Congo, there's this general notion that Congress can spend money. They can give money to the states, and when they give money to the states, they can place certain conditions on it, right? If the government gives you federal highway money, you have to make your, uh, your speed limit 65, right? If they give you certain other money, you have to you know, put a limitation on you know, whatever, okay? But this was a very big condition. By the states handing out money here, Okay. Sorry, but they got states on average receive billions of dollars every year from the feds for Medicaid budgets. Okay, what the government said in this case was, if you do not accept this new Medicaid expansion, you will lose your entire Medicaid budget. I said again, if states did not participate in Obamacare, they would lose every single penny of their Medicaid budget and basically bankrupt them. So is that really a choice? Well, what some of what was arguing the court was, it wasn't a choice; it was a false choice. It's like putting a gun to someone's head and says, your money or your life. There's no actual choice there. This was simply a way to force states into accepting the money, as the argument went. Okay? So Paul Clement said, listen, we can't have these states being forced to collect all the money. Okay? We can't force states to take this. Okay. So after the case was argued at the very end, everyone thought that this guy, Voldemort, right? Or, or, or I'm sorry, Anthony Kennedy. You guys have Quidditch capital of the world, I heard something, right? The number one Harry Potter school? Yeah. Are you not proud of that? <laughs> I heard they played Quidditch in that, that sunken garden thing. <laughs> Anyways, so after the case was argued, <laughs> uncomfortable laughter, right? After this case was argued, everyone thought this guy, just Anthony Kennedy, would be the deciding vote, the swing vote, right? He's always a swing vote in affirmative action and abortion and whatever. But it was actually this guy, right? The, the, this doe-eyed, gazing, you know, blue steel eyes of John G. Roberts Jr. And the fate of the entire Obama administration would fall on this man's shoulders. Um, and I don't, I don't put this lightly, because looking back at the president's first term, other than like, I think it's like Dodd-Frank, whatever, this is all he did. This defined his first term, and it's gonna define his second term, right? If he can't pull this off, this will be such a blow for progressivism, it's hard to even calculate. This is not just like, we lose a law. This is like, we realize that government can't do this. They tried, they failed utterly. Uh, so the significance of this law is, is, is very hard to, hard to comprehend. So we have these two guys. We have uh, you know, John Roberts, we have Barack Obama. Um, they're each the respective heads of their branch of government. They're both Harvard Law graduates. And, and I think that John Roberts had a very strong um, sense of weight on his shoulders. Uh, we are in the Marshall White School of Law, and you have a huge portrait of the uh, great Chief Justice himself, John Marshall. Um, and we all study Margaret vs. Madison. Do you say like an entire month on that, or do you have to like, no? You say Margaret, right? Yeah, yeah. Good. Two classes or something. That's it? Like reasonable. Reasonable, okay. <laughs> so, 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 so what did John Marshall do in Marbury that was so wonderful? Well, he kind of split the baby. He said, well, we have this power a judicial review, but we're not going to exercise it here because whatever, mandamus, whatever, right? John Roberts fashioned himself as a John Marshall type figure. He said so in his confirmation hearing. He wants to be the chief justice for everyone. So he's decided that maybe he would try to do what Solomon did and split the baby, right? Solomon didn't actually split the baby, but we'll, we'll put that aside. <laughs> so what? That's the biggest difference, right? John Roberts actually messed it up. Solomon decided not to. So what did John Roberts do here? <laughs> right. <laughs> what did the chief do here? Okay, so he did two things. Roberts first said that this law violates the Commerce Clause. 
that Congress cannot compel people to commercial activity through the commerce powers, right? That should be the end, okay? But he didn't stop there, okay? He couldn't stop there. He said, but I will rewrite this law as a tax, and as a tax, it's constitutional. Make no mistake, what John Roberts did was he rewrote the law. He, is, he conceded that the law was not written as a tax. He said that very clearly. Okay? But based on some judicial duty to save laws, like, like good old Johnny Marshall over there, he rewrote the law. He changed the word tax to penalty. He changed the word shall to may. He rewrote the essence of the law. The most contentious portion of this 2,700-page law, John Roberts changed. There's nothing restrained about that at all. Okay? Restrained approach would not rewrite a law. So, you have the president going on TV saying this is not a tax. John Roberts saying, well, it's not a penalty. Okay? The president also said, if you like your insurance, you can keep it. There were a whole host of things that were made by this law that were totally false. Well, we only realize it now. But this law was saved as a tax. And I, I like this cartoon because it actually um, uh, describes the actual law. <laughs> Under the actual law, it was, you could not go with that health insurance. It wasn't quite a crime that you go to jail for, but you assessed a penalty. The same way that if you don't pay a parking ticket, right, you, you're, you're assessed a penalty. That's how the law was written. But Robert said, there is no mandate, let's say clearly. In the Robert's opinion, he said there is no actual mandate. There is no Obamacare mandate. There is only a tax that collects if you don't have insurance. That's what he wrote the law. Okay? There was actually a joint dissent by Justices Kennedy, Scalia, Thomas Alito, which would have struck down the entire Affordable Care Act, all 2,700 pages of it, just struck the entire thing down. Uh, Justice Thomas had another uh, uh, a dissent which said that the entire 20th century is unconstitutional. <laughs> <laughs> You can bring us back to the days of like another you know, lockdown. But I mean, that, that, that basically <laughs> killed Justice Thomas. Uh, uh, <laughs> his opinion was a page map. I was like, yeah, screw it. It's still unconstitutional. <laughs> but uh, we can go for Clarence. Okay? Interestingly enough, you had Justice Breyer and Kagan join the Medicaid opinion because they said that it would be unconstitutional to force states to accept this money, the penalty of losing everything. So we'll give them a choice. Okay, what's the choice? If a state wants to opt into Obamacare, they can. If they don't, they don't have to, but they can keep their old money. So your fair commonwealth has for years resisted, but now you've elected a new governor who will probably try and bring you into it. Um, and it, it's actually unclear if he can do it by himself or if the legislature must agree to it, but you'll be dealing with this probably very soon in your, in your backyard. Uh, Justice Ginsburg and Sotomayor, uh, they would have found the entire law constitutional and they would have held everything. So that was the action going outside inside the court. But as you might recall, there are no cameras, right? So how is the media supposed to know what's going on outside the court? Okay. The second the Chief Justice announces an opinion in the court, downstairs in the basement they have paper copies, right? And the web, it's funny, the Supreme Court's website crashed immediately on decision day, which I guess was a preview of things to come. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this, is just, this is just foreshadowing, right? No literature is foreshadowing. Yeah. The Supreme Court's website crashed immediately uh, on decision day, right? So what happened? They had paper copies, the only way to get it. And you actually have these interns and sneakers and students running out to the streets with these paper copies. And they had them to reporters in the street. Okay. So, uh, so you can actually see the reporter for CNN, Kate Baldwin, and she's reading from the opinion. She's on page three. And on page three it says, the Chief Justice finds this law is, violates the Commerce Clause. So, she goes on CNN and she tells Wolf Blitzer, the law's unconstitutional. Okay. And CNN freaks out and they send notes to everywhere. They have a news blast, right? And they actually report that the law is unconstitutional. This wouldn't be it's that funny if you, if you realize who's watching CNN. The president was watching CNN. And for a solid 15 minutes, he thought his law was unconstitutional. Okay? Had the reporter turned to page four of the opinion, she would have seen where it said, but it's constitutional as a tax. But she didn't get that far. Okay? <laughs> Fox News also blew it. You actually can see Megyn Kelly with SCOTUS blog, just refreshing in the, uh, below. But eventually, well, the president was told it was a constitution. This is super happy Obama, right? <laughs> actually, what happened was one of his staffers walked in with two thumbs up, like, you won. And then he's like, but I saw it on CNN that I lost. Like, no, 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 you won, you won. 
And they actually had to wait minutes before they actually could tell the president because they were afraid of getting it wrong. Yep. This is our, our Dewey the Distributed moment for the 21st century. Uh, we'll see in the end. So in the end, I think the Solicitor General is vindicated largely. Uh, <laughs> the Chief Justice did some serious Fu Manchu with the, uh, uh, with the Constitution. Uh, he, was, he, was, he was lambasted. Um, this guy, whatever his name was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, don't I gotta take his stats not relevant anymore. Anyway, Romney, he said he's going to repeal and replace Obamacare, even though he created it in his own state of Massachusetts. He implemented Romney Care, which was effectively Obamacare, just for a state. Um, in every single debate, whenever Romney brought up health care, Obama was like, you did it first, right? He actually called Romney Care the godfather of Obamacare, right? That before there was Obamacare, there was Romney Care. And I think I need to take this cartoon out. I thought when I wrote this book that the Obama Obamacare repeal was done by the 2012 election. Right when the president gave the oath of office, <clears throat> oh man, well, I love to know what they're saying right there. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the poll report said they were cordial, I'm sure. I'll spend the money on a fancy vacation. What's, what's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, oh I, I, I see what you did there. I see what you did there. <laughs> anyway. So I used to end my presentation here by talking about the conflict, you know, the, 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 the dichotomy between President Obama and John Roberts, how the president has basically three years left, but his, his crowning signature achievement is done, and John Roberts is looking forward to the left as, as it is, uh, uh, with, the, uh, with, with a 30-year mandate, no pun intended, ahead of him to, uh, to decide many most important issues. He, my talk used to end here. Yeah, but then this happened. Uh, <laughs> my, my junior senator read uh, Green Eggs and Ham to his children on the Senate floor during a $21 filibuster. Uh, <laughs> and he emerged victoriously. And remarkably, and so this seems so long ago, the federal government shut down over Obamacare. Remember these? Remember the barricades? Yeah. And, and, then, and then we have, of course, we have this. This, this. this poor girl, by the way, her name is Adrian. She's not even an American, she's not a citizen. Uh, she, she wasn't even paid for these photos. HHS gave her these photos for free because she wants some professional photos done. Uh, <laughs> right, I mean, I, I can't make this up. HHS photographed her for free. She's not even an American citizen. She's from like, Columbia or I think somewhere. Um, anyway, she, she actually came out of Good Morning America and said she was being bullied. Uh, <laughs> you shouldn't be laughing at this. But she claims she's being cyber bully when she's these right wingers. Okay. Uh, but this website launched on October 1st and it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> 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 this is from the onion. I didn't, I didn't Photoshop this. <laughs> I can't make this up. Like, I couldn't. Like, when I wrote this book, I thought it was done, but I got to write another book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so this has been the website message everyone's been seeing. And, you know, the administration, which ran on these, you know, Facebook and Twitter, they can't build a website, okay? But what's really troubling is these. Everyone knows what these are? Cancellation notices, right? The entire, if you like your healthcare plan, you can keep it, was a lie. There's, there's no other way to say it. And this was known because the Hillary plan I mentioned earlier on was killed because they realized they would not be able to keep their plan. This law was sold on a promise of you can keep your plan. Everyone knew this wasn't true. No one, no one who had any modicum of knowledge of this law worked with think These are coming, okay? And just yesterday, I have to update it again. Just yesterday, right, you have the president saying we're going, he's going to unilaterally delay this requirement for a year. The president passed law in the White House. It's actually quite remarkable. Uh, screws, uh, forget school us rocks, right? The president just passed laws by himself. Um, if any of you actually care about the rule of law, this is stunning. You have a president that's unraveling before your eyes, and he's actually making laws up as he goes along to fix something. That's going to make it worse. By delaying this a year, it's going to make things even more expensive next year. And, and this is not even known. He's basically paying the insurance companies for their loss, which are coming from tax dollars. This thing is imploding as we speak. And uh, this was severely testifying last week. Um, the constitutional challenges to this law aren't even close to being done. There's challenges to the contraceptive mandate. There's challenges based on the origination clause. There's challenges based on the, uh, the, the Obamacare exchanges. There's so many aspects of this law that are still up in the air. Um, and I, I have to just keep updating this talk because this is the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, I wish it wouldn't. I wish I would have never written this book. But here we are. Uh, this is Obamacare. Uh, the book's called Unprecedented. It's actually for sale in the William Murray Books. Sorry, check. Uh, it's a nice like, book plate. And I will be happy to answer your questions by remaining time. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. 
Uh, so there's a lot of media attention when the after the oral arguments, when the uh, before the opinion was released, basically targeting John Roberts and saying you know, for the legacy of the court, for the reputation of the court, and uh, you know news piece after news piece. Um, can you, have you have you seen anything like that before in other cases? Do you think the uh, the media sort of went over the line and kind of the approach there? Well, not just the media, the president, right? Four days after the conference where the Supreme Court votes in the case, President Obama said, quote, it would be unprecedented for the court to strike this down. President Obama actually referenced Lochner. Okay, I think not only any president ever mentioned Lochner before, but the president said if he strikes down, this would be like Lochner. There was so much pressure on the Chief Justice from both the media and the president. Keep in mind this is before an election. The presidential election was four months away. There was definitely an attempt to kind of I'm not going to wear pressure, but to make the chief aware of what, what the consequences are of this decision. Okay? Now, he's a smart man, the chief justice. He's a brilliant guy. I don't know what's in his head. I don't know what's in his heart. We can't know. But we do know what he did. And he did something that was very bizarre and surreal. <coughs> he saved the law that was never written. He upheld the law that Congress never passed. And there's no avoiding that. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Um, so I actually was in the court when they announced the decision. You I was, were? Yeah, I was going down my wow. checklist. And I thought, too, that it was going to be struck down. But what I didn't understand, because I had my four issues listed out, was if it's a tax, then why didn't they just remand it until, or dismiss it until anti-injunction tax? Uh, OK, so, so and, uh, uh, thank you thanks for that question. So here's the rub, right? So we have this tax anti-injunction act. says you cannot sue till the tax is collected. We also have the Constitution that says you have the power to collect taxes. Ready? What the court held, for purposes of the Anti-Injunction Act, it's not a tax. This is what I don't understand. But for purposes of the Constitution, it is a tax. One is a matter of statutory interpretation, and one is a matter of constitutional interpretation. So it can be a tax and not a tax at the same time. It's not like a unicorn or some sort of mystical creature <laughs> that's never been seen before. But that, that's what the court did. Um, there's no other way of explaining it. Yes, sir, in the back. Um, now that the states don't have to, they're not mandated to expand their Medicaid, because obviously the court struck that down. They don't have to do the state, they don't have to do the state exchanges. And so a lot of the states have opted out of doing that until so the federal government steps in, clearly. But what's the effect of that? Because most of the states haven't actually implemented their own exchanges now. And so. Okay, so there's two separate things. One is actually the Obamacare exchanges, like, you know, this poor girl's website, poor Adrian, right? The reason why this website exists, healthcare.gov, is because a number of states don't want to create their own exchanges. That's different from participating in the Medicaid expansion. So, for example, my state of Texas and Virginia, there, there's the healthcare.gov works for Virginia, so it actually works. But Virginia is not participating in the Medicaid expansion. Those are separate things. Yes. Right. In addition to that, um, there was a maintenance of effort provi uh, provision in the uh, Medicaid expansion. You said that the states like contracted their Medicaid um, coverage, then they would lose everything. But that wasn't struck down in the. Well, what actually. We can talk later, but what the Supreme Court said is that power would be too broad. That 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 under the spending power, the Medi HHS cannot withdraw all the funding. Okay? I'll, I'll take one more question. I see people are answering to go. One more question? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. And I can take more questions afterwards. Uh,